Stay hungry, stay foolish. Human beings are primates, and primates are political animals. Our brains, therefore, are designed not just to hunt and gather, but also to help us get ahead socially, often via deception and self-deception. But while we may be self-interested schemers, we benefit by pretending otherwise. The less we know about our ugly motives, the better, and thus, why we don't like to talk or even think about the extent of our selfishness. This is the elephant in the brain. Such an introspective taboo makes it hard to think clearly about our nature and the explanations for our behavior. The aim of today's book, then, is to confront our hidden motives directly, to track down the darker, unexamined corners of our psyches and blast them into the floodlights. Then once everything is clearly visible, we can work better to understand ourselves. Why do we laugh? Why are artists sexy? Why do we brag about travel? You won't see yourself or the world the same after today's book. We welcome author of a multitude of titles, including the focus of today's episode, The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. It's a great pleasure to welcome Robin Hansen. Robin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. The book is like the movie The Matrix, where you decide to take the blue pill or the red pill. And once you actually take the pill, you see the behaviors everywhere. And in the book's preface, you say, you find it hard to imagine the book's central thesis becoming widely accepted among any large populations, even that of scholars, as better minds than yours have long advanced similar ideas, but to little apparent effect, you suspect that human minds and cultures must contain sufficient antibodies to keep such concepts at bay. I found this really interesting because for me personally, I'm on this hunt or this odyssey to unveil as much about human consciousness as possible. And that seems to be one of your motives as well. It is, although both of us perhaps should now have reason to doubt that. <laughs> that is, you know, when we start out as scholars and, and heroic investigators, we, we tell ourselves we are bravely wanting to discover all truths, no matter how ugly, no matter how self-incriminating. And uh, that feels very honest and, and bold. Uh, but we don't know that when we actually find them, will like them. Our book may be an example of just truths that when you discover, you realize you didn't actually want to know. Anybody who'd listened to me, I was telling them, you got to read this book. And I, I found myself looking at human behavior, almost like I was looking at one of the Planet of the Apes movies. <laughs> and I saw us as these primates with all these behaviors, thinking we're kings of the jungle, but actually that we're just animalistic. But I thought it'd be useful before we start to give a reason behind the title of the book, because that threw me myself at the start. And then I read it. And I was like, Ah, now I totally get it. But understanding this is key to understanding the concepts behind the book. The title is the uh, product of my co author who <laughs> was more interested in, in coming up with a, a cute C title like this. I'm, I'm, I'm a little more shy about titles like this, but uh, it works. And, and it's been effective. Uh, so the the riff is off the elephant in the room, which is the idea that we are all often sitting in a room talking about something. And there's a big topic that we all know is there that we're kind of walking around and pretending isn't there. <laughs> and uh, that's the elephant in the room, the thing that we all see is there. And it's really obvious. And it's really huge, but we're all pretending it's not there. And then the elephant in the brain is the part of your brain, the part of your mind that you know is there, and is big and important, but you still kind of pretend it's not. And you caught the glimpse of the elephant first, you said in 1998, maybe we'll share this as a story as well. I was an economist, and I tried to get a job after getting my PhD. And I got some interviews for professor jobs. But in the end, I took a postdoc in health policy. And health policy was a subject that I didn't know that much about. They were hiring me because I was more of a theorist, and they wanted to introduce theorists to health policy. And there was a two year a program. And in the first six months, we just went into great detail, reviewing a lot of things about health policy. I just immersed myself in the world of health and health policy. And in that sudden immersion, it was very striking that major features of the world of health and medicine were just quite at odds with the simple theoretical perspective that I had learned in graduate school and learning economic theory. 
Uh, and it's the usual perspective most of us have. So it, it seems sort of obvious. And I didn't really question it until I saw all these details about health policy. So our usual story about medicine is, well, sometimes we get sick and uh, we'd rather get well. And there are these experts like doctors and uh, who have equipment and, and uh, technical you know, things like drugs, and they need to spend years learning all these things. And when they learn all these things, they can then help us figure out how to get well, except these doctors, it's hard to judge how good they are. So we need some regulation and they, their treatment can be expensive. So we need some insurance. And that's the usual story of health and medicine. And it makes sense. Uh, but the details of health policy just didn't make sense in terms of that simple story. And our chapter in the book on medicine goes through uh, a number of particular details, but one of the most striking details about medicine that doesn't make sense from this perspective is the fact that there's actually very little correlation between health and medicine. So not only do we have studies about geographic variations, different regions that have more or less medicine and more or less health, but we also have some randomized experiments where groups of people were randomly assigned to get more or less medicine and then tracked over time. And the people who got more medicine basically by lowering their price so they would choose to get more, uh, those people weren't healthier. And that's got to make you stand back and think, uh, but I thought the whole point of medicine was to make you healthier. And if the people who get more medicine aren't healthier, what's going on? In part one of the book, you create the lens through which we look at, and then you look at these realms of life uh, through that lens and unveil them. And medicine is one that I absolutely love. Now it makes sense why that one uh, is so dear to your heart, given your 1998 experience. Let's come back to the part one of the book, and then we'll come back and go through some of those 10 aspects of life. You share a great quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson at the start, you say, every man alone is sincere. At the entrance of a second person, hypocrisy begins. I love that as a framing quote. And then you talk about the thesis of the book, you say we human beings are a species that's not only capable of acting on hidden motives, we're designed to do it. Our brains are built to act in our self interest, while at the same time trying hard not to appear selfish in front of other people. And in order to throw them off the trail, our brains often keep us our conscious minds in the dark. The less we know of our ugly motives, the easier it is from for us to hide them from others. I thought that was a great way to frame the thesis of the brain and how the brain acts and how the elephant in the brain acts. To me, the, the whole thesis of the book is just not only surprising, it's, it's sort of more surprising than I would have thought possible. <laughs> I mean, so, so as you mentioned before, just the, the entire picture that our brains are not giving us reliable truth about our world. Uh, I mean, you might have thought that's true in some margins, some, you know, visual illusions or something would somehow sometimes mislead us, but that we would just be completely wrong about huge areas of our life and our world is, is really quite striking. Um, the, the key idea, though, is that your brain uh, was designed to live in a social world. That is, for ancient humans, their main environment that mattered was other humans. Uh, as groups of humans, they were large enough to basically keep away predators to, to sort of get a reliable supply of food and, and shelter. But these other humans around them, that was the hard thing they had to deal with. And humans had norms. And that was a distinctive feature of humans compared to other animals. We had these rules about what you were supposed to do or not supposed to do. And we were supposed to watch out for each other to see if we're following these rules. And if you are accused of violating these rules and, 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 that, and people get away with that accusation, then that can have dire consequences for you. So your brain is designed to try to avoid being accused of norm violations. <laughs> and that's a big part of what your brain is designed for. And uh, so your brain is all the time looking around you, wondering what could you be accused of? <laughs> and trying to make sure you have a good story about what you've been doing to avoid that accusation. And so, in fact, a lot of what we're doing all the time is what is asking ourselves, you know, how could I ever be accused of doing anything wrong here? And what would my story be? What, what, what is the story about how I've been a good person doing good things here? And it was all just an innocent mistake. Uh, there's no need to, to hold me accountable for anything that goes wrong. That's just constantly the, what's going on in, in our subconscious and even in our conscious. Uh, so since our brain is designed to do that, then um, our conscious mind, the part of our mind that you're, you're most aware of, 
it's more the press secretary of your mind and not the king or the president. Its job is to be stand ready and to give that speech, to give that defense of yourself so that when you are accused of something, you can be ready to defend yourself. And so your conscious mind is well aware of these good stories you've come up with about what you've been doing and why and, and why it was all perfectly appropriate and that there's not any problems. That's what your conscious mind is designed to do. And so it, it has a story about yourself all the time in terms of like what you've been doing and why. Because a lot of our norms are norms that have to do with motives. So for example, if I hit you on purpose, that's a norm violation. But if I hit you accidentally, that can just be a forgivable mistake. <laughs> It's the motive that makes the difference there. And so our motives are very important in our story about why we haven't been violating norms. And that's why we pay close attention to being able to come up with good motive stories. And so your conscious mind is, is aware all the time of your motives, i.e. the story you're going to tell about why you've been doing things. And those motives feel to you like they are the right answer. They are correct. They are obvious. Uh, but just like the press secretary feels like the story they're telling is the right story about the president or king. But you know, notice the press secretary usually doesn't actually know why the president or the president <laughs> is doing what they're doing. They're not given inside information about the real you know, causes of events and choices. Their job is just to take whatever they see and come up with a good explanation that will satisfy the audience. And that's what your conscious mind is supposed to do. It's supposed to come up with a satisfying explanation. And so that's why you can just be so consistently wrong about what you're doing. Now, we criticize each other and we're open to the possibility that other people around us might be misleading us about their motives. And so we're often better at looking at other people and saying, no, I'm not so sure I believe that story about their motive and penetrating their illusion or their story and, and perhaps cutting more to the truth of why they're doing things. And that trick works when we have conflicting motives, when, when I have one motive, and you have perhaps an opposite motive, but when we all present the same motive to each other, when we all have the same sort of story we all want to present, that can make us all blind together to our motives. We may just all be saying that we are going to the doctor, for example, to get well, uh, when we're actually going for some other reason. That is just brilliant, the idea of the press secretary. You know, one of the hats I wear is an executive coach and the book just throw, threw me off totally because I'm one of the goals is to kind of, you know, ask questions to probe at the person. And now I'm going to myself, the press secretary is always given the answer. <laughs> it's not it's not the it's not the president behind here. But one of the overarching things I got from the book, Robin, was empathy, empathy for others and the benefit of the doubt and even for myself, and you say at the start of the book, in the Bible, Matthew 7, 3 says, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? And you warp that metaphor a little bit to say, why worry about the mouse in your friend's mind when you have an elephant in your own? And that was something that really kind of just blew it open for me to go, wait a second, you just cannot be judgmental here. We're animals. And when you understand how animal behaviors work, as you do, you look at primatology a lot in the book, you start to unveil so much more about human behavior. So I thought I'd jump to that because you choose some specific cases here. And in the case of animals, they appear to be doing something and simple and straightforward. But as you dig below the surface, you unveil extra layers of complexity. Two of the behaviors you give that are just brilliant are competitive altruism and the case of the Arabian babbler. I'd love if you'd share these. One thing that comes to mind is just um, primates scratching each other's back. <laughs> uh, so it's a common thing that we see then primates sitting around uh, in, you know, not out hunting, not out doing things, not sitting asleep as they are scratching each other's back. That is, they are picking pieces of dirt and bugs out of the fur of their associates. And of course, the part that you can reach the hardest is your back. So other people would be picking things out of your back. And primates spend a fair bit of time doing this. And it seems like they are just being helpful. <laughs> I mean, of course, you would want things picked out of your back. Uh, now, we might ask, well, how long do they spend picking things out of each other's back? And two 
obvious predictions might be that in a dirtier environment, say, where there's more things that would get in your back, you might spend more time picking things out of your back. And another might be, well, if your back is just bigger, <laughs> say, compared to your fingers or the size of the things you'd be picking out, well, it will just take longer to pick things out of your back. Uh, but those don't, in fact, predict how long you spend picking things out of the fur of the other primates. What does predict is the size of your social group, how many people are in the group. So a group of 50 is going to be spending a lot more time picking out than a group of five. Now, but the size of the group really isn't related to sort of the need of your back, how much dirt is there, how small the bugs are, et cetera. But it is related to your need to show that you care about your associates. So the larger the group, the more competition there is to gain allies and to convince people that you're on their side. And so the interpretation is that they are mainly cleaning each other's backs as a way to show, hey, I'm your bro. We, I care about you. <laughs> We're together. And, uh, you know, don't forget me when uh, times are tough. And I love the story of the Arabian babbler. So the idea I was telling my son this, that, you know, there's a, a, a beta male uh, at the top of the tree on lookout duty. So this is a certain type of bird. And uh, I'm an alpha male. And I come along and I just push him off the perch and go, I, I'm on duty now. I'm looking out for the for the tribe. I love that story. Perhaps you'll elaborate on that. In addition uh, to pushing aside the other, they will also take food and shove it down the throats of the beta <laughs> so that in this bird group, uh, there are some animals who are taking on more responsibility to take a risk to be at the top of the bush to watch out for predators. And they're also giving food to the other uh, birds. And that on the surface looks very helpful. It looks like they're you know sticking out for each other and making sure they sort of sacrifice one for the team. Uh, but the fact that they fight over this role <laughs> suggests that it's a sign of status. That is, they are respected for being at the top bird and taking on these risks, and that they are gaining from the status in their group, that they are gaining more mates and more allies by showing that they are stronger and better able to take these risks and uh, costs. But what I would thought particularly interesting is if the beta, you explain this in the book, the beta or lower comes along to take over from the alpha, the alpha will will ignore them and actually make them wait. And I thought about how you see this in office, office politics. Sometimes the leader may make somebody wait there, even if they don't really have to wait, just just to show just, they can. Exactly. Yeah. And, and actually how that plays out as well, where you talked about shoving the food down the mouth of another is the same as the office politics we see where people are training trading resources or favors in order to have those people in your back, you know, you, as you said, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours in the future to create little allies and alliances for the future. It's exactly the same as us in organizations. Human organizations have an awful lot of politics and a awful lot of ways we hide it, which we pretend to be doing other things. And so, yes, we're often justifying our actions in terms of, you know, benefits for the company and overall morale and, uh, you know, scientific accuracy, etc. when what we're really doing is supporting our coalitions. You say many signs suggest that the keys to our intelligence lie in the harsh, unflattering light of social challenges, the arena of zero sum games in which one person's gain is another's loss. It's not that we're completely unaware of these competitive zero sum instincts, we just tend to give them less prominence when explaining our own behavior. In a group, we're kind of supposed to be doing things for the group. So if we get sort of the hidden motives and norms, one of the norms, say, in a company is that your actions are supposed to benefit the company, and they're not supposed to be benefiting your coalition. You're not supposed to be, you know, helping your division at the expense of a neighboring division or help the, you know, coworker that's your buddy against other competing coworkers. That's not supposed to be why you do things. Uh, you're supposed to. And so we are adept at finding ways to justify what we do in terms of these larger purposes, which means we're somewhat hiding these more selfless purposes. But, you know, just to be very clear, we want to be part of coalitions and we have many kinds of associations of coalitions. So mating is one. We want to find mates. And when we find a mate, we are part of that pair. And that's a coalition together against the world. We're trying to be attractive to other you know, coalition partners, other mating partners out there. And in addition, we are 
trying to form coalition groups like we might at uh, work, groups of people who will support each other and be loyal, and we're trying to attract them to be part of you know, our group and for them to let us into their group. And in all these cases, we have to do a lot basically to convince them that we are loyal to them and that they should like us. And we're trying to show off whatever characteristics we could find that would be attractive to them. And we're trying to emphasize those characteristics as much as we can. Uh, but again, we're trying to pretend we're doing otherwise because to do so would be, again, to go against the norm that we're really not supposed to be having these internal coalition fights. We're supposed to be going for the whole company or the whole church or the whole country or whatever is the larger unit that we're justifies our actions. I hope none of my neighbors uh, listen to the show because <laughs> I have a confession to make. So I was reading the book and um, I, I have a... I have a bug in some of the the hedges around my around my where I live, and it's also in the the hedges of the neighbors. So it's kind of like COVID, you know, one person up the road has it, we have to kind of lock it down. So I bought this natural kind of uh, predator. It's, it's called a nematode. That the bug, it's called a weevil, eats and it, it kills it, and it's natural and it doesn't affect children or anything like, or humans. So I bought some, but I bought extra. And I was like, oh, okay, there's no point in just doing my hedgerow. I have to do my neighbors because otherwise mine will just keep getting reinfected. <laughs> so I was doing, I was, I started to water mine with this uh, nematode and it was getting dark. And I was, I went, hmm, the elephant in the brain. I'm actually doing this for my own personal gain, but it looks like it's altruism. It looks like I'm helping out my neighbors here. I could actually, go ahead and do this in darkness, or I could actually turn it to my advantage. <laughs> so I waited for the next morning. And I told my neighbors, I was like, I'm just gonna water your thing here. And I was like, kind of going use the elephant to my to my own advantage. So I'm not I'm sure that's not the goal of the book. But uh, it certainly unveiled the real reason. And you say this about you, for example, writing the book that you know, when when we publish books, we say, Oh, it's great, you know, I'm trying to educate the world and share my ideas, but there's ulterior motives at play. But not looking at them is often to our advantage. So this is something we have to admit about the book. Uh, it's not necessarily a good self help book. <laughs> that is, uh, if you were not to be aware of this motive for helping your neighbors and, and you were to meet your neighbors and talk to them, then they might see the sincerity in your voice and in your face that you were really just trying to help because that was what's in the forefront of your mind. When, when you're more conscious that you're there for this sort of social benefit, they might see that in your voice and in your face and perhaps give you less credit for your generosity. <laughs> and so being unaware of these hidden motives is usually in our interest. And that's why you have been designed not to be aware of these things. And that's why we might be doing you a bit of disservice by telling you. about. <laughs> I have to say, I actually felt better knowing because I felt I was more in control of the faculty. At least I was, as you said, the floodlights were on and I wasn't going around with a little uh, flashlight that har hardly worked. Usually we think we want to have a flashlight, but maybe if the view is ugly enough when we turn on the lights, maybe we don't want to see. So we would say that somebody in the world should understand this stuff. So it's not obvious that everybody should, or even that most people should, because uh, clearly evolution designed each one of us not to understand these things. And so there's plausibly a personal cost to understanding these things, but we have this large complicated world we're in where we're not sure we're doing things right in terms of medicine or education or politics, et cetera. And some people try to think about those institutions and ask how they might be different and whether that would be better. And those people should have a clear understanding of what's going on under how these things work. So that would be our strongest pitch is to say, if you want to think about the institutions in your world and figure out what's actually going on in your various social behavior in order to figure out how perhaps to change it, then you should read our book to know what's really going on. I think it's it's a I think it is a brilliant self help book. But it, it uh, as you say, the you take the the blue pill in the matrix, and you just don't come back again, you see things uh, the way they really are. But building on that, because I, I thought one of the really valuable ways to see society, and if you zoom in and look at it this way, there's two ways to the top of society, if, if you deem this as the top, there's dominance, or prestige or both. So understanding this was another key lens from the book. 
humans have this very ancient norm against dominance. That is um, chimpanzees or other sorts of primates. They have very explicit dominance hierarchies where some group of chimpanzees is the top and uh, they get advantages. They get the advantage location, best food, best mates, and others don't. And humans created this, what's called a reverse dominance hierarchy where everybody sort of gets together and says, we're not going to let anybody dominate anybody here. And if anybody tries to do that, the rest of us are going to gang up on them and make them stop. And that was an important element in early human behavior. And so they were very uh, egalitarian in that way. And they shared food and they made collective decisions, but they allowed prestige. <laughs> and prestige is another way that some people are better than others, but not via threatening power or, or you know, physical power or other threats. It's through uh, just being admirable and other people wanting to follow and copy you. And so humans it's okay to be prestigious and in fact, admirable to be prestigious, but bad to be dominant. And we can see the difference in terms of whether you look at someone, someone who's acting dominant, you don't look them in the eyes because to look them in the eyes would be to challenge them. And then they'd have to assert their dominance by, you know, pushing you down. Uh, whereas if they're prestigious, it's perfectly fine to look straight at them because you're admiring them and, and wanting to be like them and wanting to copy them. <laughs> and so humans admire prestige and resist dominance. And uh, of course, this creates an opening <laughs> whereby when we need to accept dominance, we pretend it's prestige. Uh, and that sort of let, lets us obey bosses, actually, in our world. <laughs> so uh, in our world, compared to ancient worlds, we have these hierarchical organizations which require a lot of coordination and therefore require some sort of centers to issue orders that go out to other people, which feels a lot like dominance. Giving someone an order feels like they're dominating you. And it's easily to see that way. And we humans are supposed to resist that thing, which is a classic reason why people have thought bosses were bad and that uh, you shouldn't accept bosses. But of course we have to. But if we can see our bosses as prestigious, then uh, we can say, no, no, I'm not obeying dominance. I'm following prestige. My, my boss is tall and handsome and well-educated and articulate and hardworking. And uh, he's got a good idea for what we should be doing. And I'm, I'm going along with that good idea. I thought about that. If you think about for, for our audience, think about the meeting, you know, maybe it's a board meeting, and the owner of the company there, the CEO is there, and you steal at glance, <laughs> versus then the CEO, she looks at you. And if you maintain eye contact, then it's kind of awkward. So you kind of glance away. And that's exactly what you're talking about, right? Dominance, right? Although the CEO often tries to pretend to be prestigious. So in the modern world, bosses are very hesitant to give direct orders. <laughs> they sort of indirectly say it would be nice if uh, that would be better if this, et cetera. But whereas in the more ancient world, people would you know, give more direct orders and even beat people <laughs> who weren't doing exactly what they thought. And bosses don't beat their employees so much in our world, nor do they you know, give them as many direct orders. So they are trying to appear prestigious, even though they need stuff to happen. You mentioned earlier on mating. And an important similarity you highlight is that each game requires two complementary skill sets, the ability to evaluate potential partners, the ability to attract good partners. In sex, the partners we are looking at are looking for mates. And in social sta status, we're looking for friends and associates. And in politics, we're looking for allies, people to team up with. I thought these different distinctions were really important to understand sex, it's partners, to mate with social status, it's friends and associates and politics, it's allies or people to create alliances with. These are just three different scales in some sense of social organization. Uh, mating, we mostly do with particular others to form a pair, whereas friendship networks would be, you know, a few uh, couples to perhaps dozens of friends. Uh, but then we're part of these larger societies where we form political coalitions, which span the entire society. And uh, we want to show uh, that we are loyal to each of these groups, and we want each of these groups to accept us as loyal members of their groups. Uh, but we have different strategies for each of these groups. So for mates, you want to show yourself as an attractive mate. Uh, and part of that is to show yourself that other people like you and other people find you valuable and you're, you're smart and energetic and you know perhaps young, all the other sorts of characteristics that might be attractive in a mate. Whereas for friends, you want to show that you are loyal to them. You uh, will look, you know, watch out for them. You, you care about them. You, you're attentive to what they want and you understand them. 
and that you will have their back if there's a conflict between them and somebody else. Um, and those are sort of very local things. But it, politics is more about larger coalitions. Now, in a firm, it can be a coalition within the firm. There might be different factions in the firm. Or, and then perhaps in, in a nation, there might be faction in the nations. But in politics, we're trying to show loyalty to our faction. And so if our faction is associated with some position, we want to show our loyalty to that position. <laughs> and if some, you know, something else is associated with the opposite position, we want to distance ourselves from that. And in fact, that's very important to us because we want the people around us who share our politics to feel like we are loyal to our political faction. Now, in, in a modern democracy, uh, the vote, the number of people voting is usually so large that it's very rare for the election to be decided by exactly one vote. And so you actually have a relatively little influence over the entire election in terms of your vote, but you can influence what people around you think. And so plausibly, you're paying a lot more attention to projecting the right image and stance toward politics because of that than because of actually how you would influence the election. So on politics, I'll skip there because I was telling you, I just finished the book five minutes before we came on and I read the politics chapter and I thought it was interesting how you say, like, if you were to ask me the nitty gritty about a certain candidate that I voted for, I'll forget, particularly a few months later. But it's the thing I pay attention to are the values or the espoused values of that candidate or the party that they are they are part of. There are many political offices where the person in that office can only influence a limited range of topics. So, for example, in the United States, the president really can't do much about education. Education is more of a state and local issue. Nevertheless, people care that their president share their opinions and stance about uh, education. And people are actually more interested in seeing that their politicians share their stances on opinions that they are actually effective. So in Congress, for example, there are Congress people who are good at sort of managing committees and making deals behind the scene and putting together packages that, that'll get passed. And others are not so good at all that politicking. Uh, but most voters don't seem to care about that difference. <laughs> They mainly seem to care that you share their opinions, even if their opinions uh, don't actually matter for the current set of bills that will come up or even the kinds of things Congress can have opinions on. And map that then to what you say about medicine. So in the chapter about medicine, you say, well, the same thing happens there when somebody goes to a doctor, they're actually not going, well, what's the record this doctor has, etc. It's actually more, do I like them? Do I get on with them, etc. It's a striking fact about both law and medicine. <laughs> that the way we choose them is primarily based on status and prestige and much less on other things we could use. So that is, we could use track records for lawyers and, and doctors. We could have a record of which patients they had and which conditions they had and, and what the outcome was, and then perhaps doing regressions of those things, controlling for various factors. That would be a completely reasonable way to judge our doctors and our lawyers. I actually know someone who has a startup where they're trying to collect track records on lawyers because lawyers you know, events are happening in courtroom as they're public, but they're just filed away in dirty file cabinets in the basements of courthouse. And they're actually hard to collect all these records, but customers don't seem very interested in track records of doctors or of lawyers. In fact, we have a, a famous experiment uh, in medicine where people about to undergo heart surgery who faced say a one to 3% risk of dying in that surgery <laughs> were asked whether they wanted to see the track records of that surgeon compared to other surgeons and, and perhaps their hospital compared to other hospitals. And this information would have been worth many tens of thousands of dollars, according to this, uh, you know, high risk they had of dying, but only 8% were willing to pay 50 bucks for this information. <laughs> uh, they just didn't want to know. They would rather just trust their doctor. And uh, this is how we do many kinds of important decisions. We, we want to have a you know, relationship with a high status person and have it feel like a trusting relationship where, where we're not being skeptical about them and holding them to some standards, but we're just trusting them. I mean, the other thing we could do with these lawyers and doctors, we could give them incentive contracts. That is, we could set it up so that when we had good outcomes, they got more money and vice versa. Sometimes we do that with lawyers with what's called contingent fee contracts, but it's very rare. And it's seen as low status uh, in distrusting of those doctors. Only low status doctors would accept a contingency contract because the high status ones are convincing you on the basis of their prestigious law firm and the school they got their degree from. 
I thought that was so dangerous in a world of social media popularity where somebody can create a persona. I mean, we see it with influencers. You know, the influencer all of a sudden, you know, is uh, maybe a sports influencer and the next thing they're selling medicine <laughs> or they're selling some type of vitamin. You know, you might say it would be terrible if somebody from a low rank school managed to get a lot of legal clients on the basis of being an influencer on social media. What we really want is lawyers from high prestige schools. But you might ask, well, are you sure that lawyers from high prestige schools actually give you better outcomes? <laughs> and uh, you shouldn't be so sure of that. Neither should you be so sure that doctors from prestigious schools give you better medical outcomes. Uh, you might think you should care more about the actual outcomes and their individual track records or the incentives they have. But strikingly, we don't care much about that. And similarly, even for politicians, we don't seem very interested in their track records. And they don't even make credible promises. So strikingly, uh, any politician could not only make a promise, they could post a bond that says this bond will be forfeit if I ever violate this promise. And they almost never do that. We don't seem interested in that. We wouldn't actually vote for them more if they did so true and you know what it made me think about was um even getting a second opinion i remember actually getting a second opinion and it's re it's really awkward it's just trusting the first opinion you're yeah. somehow questioning it i mean who are you to question this prestigious person yeah but of course and the second person is often prestigious the second person is quite qualified to question the first person <laughs> But you're even asking a second person to question the first person somehow puts you at in some sense of disrespect or lack of allegiance to uh, your first opinion. Yeah, because it's it's like it's like almost being thrust into a, a really really important relationship and going, I don't have any choice but to believe this one person, and this person may have stopped learning the latest trends in medicine ten years ago, and and here I am trusting this one person. It, it doesn't make sense to me. But it's st I still went and got the second opinion, and I still wanted to get a third. <laughs> so You don't necessarily want the latest in medicine. So here's a few interesting facts about big versus small hospitals. Uh, big hospitals basically do all the treatments that are done at small hospitals, but small hospitals do, do all the treatments that are done at big hospitals. So big hospitals get the new treatments first. Uh, secondly, for anything that's done at both hospitals, Whichever hospital does it more often is better at it. So if you're a hospital that gets a lot of gunshot wounds, you're better at gunshot wounds. And that's where you want to go for a gunshot room is whichever hospital deals with that more often. So these two facts would seem to suggest that the big hospitals are just always better. I mean, they get the newer treatments and they're better at anything they do more often. But in fact, big hospitals are about the same as small ones in terms of your outcomes. Why is that? Well, it's mainly because the new treatments are worse. And this is just a general fact of innovation in most areas of society. You're aware, quite aware of this when you look at other new things in the rest of society. You just don't think about it with medicine. <laughs> the world is full of a sequence of products, most of which are old, and then some new products show up and people try them out and most of the new products get thrown away <laughs> as not better than the old ones. And then a small fraction of the new ones become the products that we keep and then those are better than the old ones. So innovation is a selection process of choosing a small number of better things out of a big pool of worse things. Uh, but with medicine, we've got this idea that we want the newer treatments. Why? Well, they're more prestigious, whatever, <laughs> because you know it takes more knowledge and expertise to be someone who learns about the new treatment and is first able to do it and able to master it. Whereas the perhaps the person at the smaller hospital does the old treatment, they're somehow showing they're less expert and less up on the latest. But why do you want to be up on the latest? Damn elephant at me again, man. It's it's <laughs> get out of my brain. So I, I wanted to bring it back to something because we, we are judging machines, we're, we're judging animals, we're, like we're designed to be judgmental. And we try not to be judgmental. And you say it goes against the grain of every evolved instinct we have, which is to judge others readily, while at the same time advertising oursel ourselves as so we can't be judged. And this is this kind of contrast or this kind of battle that goes on in the brain. As you say, I mean, obviously, it's important for us to judge each other. And so obviously, we do judge each other. And Obviously, we have a lot of mental machinery available to us to do that. We're, we're not aware of most of the processes of doing the judging, but it's pretty clear we're doing a lot of it. On the other hand, we often have these norms that say we shouldn't be judging people. And so we try not to look like we're judging people. 
And that's related to sort of the, the norm against subgroup coalitions. Again, we often have a group like the company and the norm is the company is a unit and we're all in it together and we aren't fighting each other inside. That's the common norm. Uh, and then a norm might be like, we all accept everybody and we're all equal. So for, for example, in forager groups, which go hunting with bows and arrows, uh, you know, some people are better hunters than others. And the simplest norm is that whoever has the arrow that strikes the animal, well, they bring back the meat and they distribute the meat, and then they're going to give the better meat to their friends and allies and family. Uh, but everybody will get some. But forager groups are, are less happy with this because it looks like dominance because you're the stronger, better hunter and, and you're getting more meat and you're getting to, to, you know, give, decide who gets your meat. So what they do is they have each hunter have their own personal arrowheads or most personal arrows, and then they swap them just before they go out to the hunt. And so now if, you know, my arrowhead hits the animal, I get to distribute the meat, but somebody else shot that arrowhead from their bow. And so we've tried to randomize and try to hide the fact that I'm a better hunter because we see that as dominance. Of course, they gossip and everybody really knows. <laughs> so who are they fooling? Well, they're, they're pretending that they don't care so much about who's the better hunter and trying to you know, act as if that doesn't matter so much, but it does. That's so good, man. I, I'm just thinking of, you know, in office politics and like kind of going, that was my idea. <laughs> I <Right>. love <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Said just loudly enough so somebody might overhear it, but not loudly enough to make it sound like you were trying for someone. Yeah, exactly. Or, or over by the tea break and uh, or the coffee break and kind of going, what did you think of Robin's idea there? Yeah, I told him that. <laughs> so you spread it, spread the, the news. It was my arrowhead. I loved your story of the Redwoods and their arms race for the light, so to speak. Let's share that because uh, you use that to introduce the topic about how to avoid wasteful competition, which is just intriguing, by co co coordinating our actions using norms, as you mentioned, and norm enforcement. When we compete, we spend resources in the competition, and sometimes that competition can be wasteful. <laughs> The resources don't go to anything fundamentally valuable. And so we all end up just spending more resources without getting any collective benefit, although we do show who's stronger or better somehow. So an example are trees. You know, what trees do is they collect light from the sun and the light from the sun would hit the tr trees if the trees were only one foot tall. <laughs> trees don't need to be very tall in order to collect sunlight. And so small bushes would be plenty enough to collect sunlight. So what are the trees doing tens of feet above the ground. Well, the problem is if one tree grows a little taller, it collects more sunlight and casts shadows on the other bushes and they have to be taller as well in order to rise up to get the sun. And so if you want to get as full sunlight, you have to be as tall as the rest of the trees. And so there's a competition among the trees to rise high and to collect as much sunlight as possible. And of course, redwoods are famously some of the tallest trees, which rise the highest to collect the most sunlight. But you know, the effort they do to that is mostly a waste. These trees are producing these enormous trunks and, and the strong fiber that, that they don't actually you know, help their body. And all of this effort is a waste, but they each have to play that game. And so here you might've thought the trees are competing with squirrels or um, insects that would eat their leaves or <laughs> other sort or the wind knocked them over. And that, you know, the, it was the outside threats that were the main problem with the trees. But here, for the trees, it's really the internal competition. The trees are mostly fighting other trees to get a little more sunlight. And we can think of that as a metaphor for humans in large social groups. When it's the social group that matters, you're mostly competing with other people in your group. And you're less competing with the outside world or predators or prey. All of those things are manageable, but you need to do better in your group. And then you want to ask, well, what is it that helps you do better in your group? Well... Uh, say having a bigger brain can help if it helps you navigate these complicated social interactions that you have. And that's one of the plausible reasons why humans have the biggest brains around. We have unusually large groups for primates and our social interactions are especially complicated. And that's why we need to have big brains. That's the social brain hypothesis that your brains are mainly big to be social. And so instead of thinking about needing big brains to make tools or to calculate plans to get over the next hill or to sort of figure out how to get around a predator, uh, you have big brains in order to get around the people around you. That spoke to me so much, that whole idea about the norms. So I'm a redwood. 
I it's in my norm to compete against the other redwoods. Like if I decide I'm going, hey guys, I'm not I'm not growing. I'm happy with my height here. <laughs> and then the other redwoods kind of go, you weirdo, Aiden. You're a total weirdo. Why don't you grow like the rest of us? So in society, I go, I don't want a car. I don't want to keep up with the Joneses. I'm happy with my lot, and I I stand out not in a good way to the rest of the community. And then they start to shun me or disregard me in some way. Then we might all together create a norm against some kinds of wasteful competition. And we might think of that's the norm against dominance in human groups. So in a primate group, uh, the dominance hierarchy might be settled by fights. We might have fist fights and, and uh, stealing things and, and a lot of violence in order to decide who's dominant. And human groups decided, well, that wasn't such a good way to decide who's on top because that's pretty destructive. And so we create this norm. Nobody, nobody hits anyone. Nobody threatens to hit anyone. Uh, you share the food, et cetera. You're going to compete, but you'll compete on prestige on things that are less harmful. If you can be the better hunter, then you can compete on that. If you can sing the better song around the campfire, you can make better campfires. If you can do things that are helpful to all of us, then we want to channel your competitive efforts in those directions. And, you know, in general, that's a relatively positive move. Let's build on what I was saying there about the whole idea of going against the norm, because it would be remiss of me not to mention the Emperor's New Clothes, like you mentioned in the book, because it's actually one of the sub headlines of our show is is calling stuff out that doesn't get enough limelight, like your book, I believe. I think it's a fantastic book. It's one of the best books I've read in such a long time. I really loved it. Because the this show likes to point at those things. It likes to turn on the floodlight to things that we don't see enough. And I'm just going to quote this to tee you up. The whole town knew that the king was being swindled by the con men, but this fact was crucially not common knowledge. Everyone saw the king was naked, but at the same time, everyone was worried that other people might believe the con men. So no adult was willing to speak up and risk looking like a fool. And yet, once the innocent child said what everyone else was thinking, it broke the conspiracy of silence. And then, like water from a bursting dam, knowledge flooded out from the closets and into the commons. I thought that was a beautiful line, well said, and I'd love you to elaborate on this. It's a hopeful and perhaps somewhat fantastical story. <laughs> that is, people like us who are in the habit of telling people things they don't want to hear, we'd like to believe that if only we could push a little harder and make them listen, that suddenly everything would switch and the world would accept what we have to say. Uh, sometimes that does happen. A lot of times it doesn't. So it's worth pausing and asking, okay, at this moment, the child says the king has no clothes. And the you know parent standing next to the child, of course, knows that the king has no clothes, <laughs> or at least that someone like me doesn't see the king with having clothes. So of course, part of the story was that only the virtuous <laughs> would see <laughs> the clothes. And so each person might think, okay, I don't see the clothes, but I guess that means I'm not virtuous. So uh, maybe I should hide that fact and go along and pretend to be virtuous by saying I see the clothes. And this child here doesn't see the clothes. But of course, according to this theory, well, maybe the child isn't virtuous. <laughs> Therefore, the child doesn't see the clothes either. So it's not terribly surprising the child would say that they don't see the clothes. Although you might have taught the child not to say that. And this child happens to have not taken that lesson very well. Um, so... Uh, you know, the question is, if enough people think that enough other people might be about to switch, then they might switch. And this is a, a standard story in, say, revolutions or protests, uh, which is, you know, a lot of us are unhappy about something. And then somebody goes out and protests. And now somebody else thinks, oh, well, now that I see that person protesting, I'm willing to join the protest. And then a third person might see that and, and it might sort of grow. And the question is, you know, how many people does it take to get how many other people to be willing to admit to something and say it out loud? And then perhaps eventually enough people will say that we all realize that even most of us are, aren't too happy about something. And you know that's why, say, a repressive government would be especially eager to prevent those first few people from ever going out. But of course, if they put a high cost on going out, then that first few person who goes out and willing to pay that high cost sends a much stronger signal that they are actually unhappy. So... <laughs> You may, you know, have the opposite effect by getting out. So whereas in our world, it's so easy to complain. Somebody complains on Twitter, Twitter, you hardly think that's much of a message at all. <laughs> Maybe we don't actually find out that all of us are unhappy about something just because 
we know so many people are just eager to complain just as a matter of habit. They just like to complain. So it's not actually clear in the story of the emperor's new clothes that one child pointing out the emperor being naked would actually make everybody switch. And in fact, we have lots of things that we all hide our eyes from in our society that, that a few people often expose and we just ignore that. And in fact, that's what we say at the, at, in our book, as you mentioned, that people throughout history have said many things like what we're saying in our book. They have pointed out many sorts of, uh, of ways in which we are hypocritical and the world has gone on ignoring them. <laughs> some people have acknowledged those things, enough people that some of these people became somewhat famous and that we have records of them. And the people who said such things and nobody listened, we don't have records of. But it's just not going to be clear when we're willing to acknowledge these things and when not. And, and plausibly, it just might be, have to do with sort of the social status of the people making the complaint or pointing out the problem. If, for example, this young child was handsome and, and from rich parents and had a great future, then we might think, ah, well, this child's going to say that. So the future kids will say that. So I want to be on, on their team. It made me think about, well, for me, not saying it, not being the kid who goes, hey, this is bull. <laughs> this is bull crap. He's, he's naked. I'd feel like I was wearing a mask and I'd actually kind of feel at odds with myself and make me feel sick. And I wanted to connect that to right to the end of the book to part two to uh, religion, because uh, you talked about how sermons worked. And I wanted to try and connect the dots here between these two chapters, you say, for example, if a preacher is standing up railing against contraception or homosexuality, for example, you might personally disagree with the message. But unless enough people boo the message or speak out against it, the norm will lodge itself into common consciousness. Thus, by attending a sermon, you're learning not just what God, in inverted commas here, or the preacher thinks, but also what the rest of your congregation, and this is the key point, is willing to accept. And that is one of the key points you make here. You can have an equilibrium where everybody goes along with something and you know, that can be consistent with most everyone privately thinking that's a great norm and most everyone privately thinking that's a bad norm. <laughs> Both are consistent with the fact that everyone's going along with it. And so you can't be that sure what everybody really thinks by looking at a norm. Of course, you could think that you know, historically, somehow your culture has been selected to have a norm like that. And therefore, perhaps historically, cultures were better off having such a norm. And you might think, well, I guess that means I should too. And that's, of course, been long been a force for conservatism and, and keep you know, being reluctant to make changes. Uh, but of course, you know, it can work the opposite, of course, uh, for changes that are we're too eager to make. <laughs> so once we all know that many norms might be something none of us really support, some people might support the opposite norm, say, to, to be in, embracing of homosexuality. And then enough other people might think, well, that's going to be the new norm and jump on that bandwagon. And uh, we might all think, oh, that's the new bandwagon. And I should jump on it, too. And we might all jump on the bandwagon believing that that's going to be the new thing. And we want to be first to be jumping on the new thing to show our support for the new thing. But that doesn't necessarily mean we all believe that new thing is a better norm. <laughs> the mere fact of change doesn't show that it's better off. The, the mere fact that the child said the king was naked and everybody agreed doesn't mean the king was naked. <laughs> that's a separate objective fact about the world. And it might have been the king was actually closed and people decided they wanted to show their opposition to the king by calling him naked it's so uh, poignant for the listeners of the show robin because many of them are the kids <laughs> who calls out the organization needs to change we need to change what we do etc and as you say there's a price to pay for that because you go against the congregation sometimes and it doesn't work whistleblowers it doesn't always end well it actually mostly doesn't end well for the whistleblower right but the key thing to notice is the mere fact that there's a whistleblower doesn't mean the whistleblower is right <laughs> We just need to hold ourselves to this independent objective standard that says that, look, the social consensus can be wrong in both directions. And we just have to look at our evidence to decide what's actually true and, and not be swayed either by the fact that social consensus is against something or by the fact that somebody is being heroically uh, paying costs and brave in order to oppose it. Both of those are only weak indication that something's true. One of the things that really jumped out to me was in innovation work or change work or any type of new ideas within an organization, oftentimes 
the best tactic is to make your idea someone else's idea, like I mentioned about like kind of like the arrows. <laughs> let let them think it was their arrow that hit the hit the, the target. But and this happens a lot in innovation where it's actually strategic sometimes to let your boss steal the credit for your idea when it's successful. <laughs> because they'll only take the credit when they're successful. And you tell us, in general, it's much easier for first hand witnesses to detect a crime than to convince others who are far removed. The takeaway for the would be cheater is that anything that hampers enforcement or prosecution will improve the odds of getting away with a crime. And this is where discretion comes in. And such discretions you talk about can take many forms including pretexts, discreet communication, skirting a norm, and subtlety. Maybe we can share a little on each or an overview of them all. Be easy to go through an example. <laughs> so uh, in many areas of the United States, uh, it's illegal to walk outside drinking alcohol. Uh, you're supposed to do that inside somewhere. Um, yet, of course, many people want to walk outside drinking alcohol. And police don't really want to enforce this law. <laughs> Most of them don't believe it's very important. They don't believe that people drinking alcohol outside are causing much problem. And so the police are kind of looking for an excuse not to enforce the law. And so uh, that's part of the discretion and subtlety. You don't have to sort of convince them you're not drinking alcohol in public. You just have to give them an excuse to think that you're not drinking alcohol in public in order to get away with drinking alcohol in public. And this is the origin of the brown paper bag that is uh, you might go to a liquor store and buy a bottle of, al of alcohol, and you would be given a brown paper bag to put that bottle in. And then you would open the bottle, but keep it in the bag and drink out of the bottle with the bag around the bottle. And so now the police might see you drinking something out of a bag in public, and they're almost sure that it's alcohol because why else would you keep the bag around the bottle? <laughs> but they can't prove that it's alcohol until they walk up and ask you to show them it. And they don't want to actually enforce the rules. So they can use that as an excuse. Oh, well, they are drinking out of the brown paper bag and I didn't have sufficient cause to ask them to show me whether it was alcohol. But what's really going on is they don't want to enforce the rule. The key point is that uh, many of us are breaking rules all the time and the people around us are seeing us break the rules all the time. But their choice is whether to whether to see it officially <laughs> and to call us on it or whether to just let it slide. And that's, of course, a key problem that often rules that we care about are let slide. So, for example, in the Me Too uh, stories, there are many people who are harassing worker co-workers around them. And many other people around them were well aware of that harassment. Uh, there's a nice movie called The Assistant, which uh, portrays that scenario. Uh, yet the people around them had excuses to pretend they didn't see. Uh, they had ways to say, well, you know, that could have been innocent. There were other possible interpretations, or maybe I wasn't even there, I wasn't looking in that direction, or I was too busy and I had to do something else, or if I did something, I would suffer the consequences, but nobody else would back me up, that's what I believed, and therefore, you can just let things slide. And in some sense, a lot of rule breaking is basically getting the people around you to be willing to go along with your rule breaking in the sense of pretending not to see. It's so important for organizations um, to avoid huge crises. We, we had um, had a show on Enron a few weeks ago, we talked about that, you know, the same thing happened, people turned a blind eye or decided, you know, my bonus is more important than actually calling things out. The diesel gates scandal, it goes on and on. But let's bring it all together the way you do in the book and you do it in one of your TED talks as well, with some science to back it all up. Because in the 1960s and 70s, neuroscientists Roger Sperry and Michael Gazinga conducted some of the most profound research in the history of psychology, a series of experiments that would launch Gazinga into an illustrious career as the grandfather of cognitive neuroscience, and for which Sperry would eventually win the Nobel Prize in 1981. I'd love you to share this and the context of the elephant in the brain. The key question is how capable are humans of having hidden motives? That is, how often do we have one motive that actually drives our behavior and have another motive that's what we think happens? Now, I'm pretty sure all of us will admit this happens at some frequency. 
we can all make mistakes, surely, about our motives. And therefore, sometimes we're going to be mistaken about our motives. The claim in the book here is that we have a lot of hidden motives. And you might think, well, that claim is pretty surprising and you're going to need some more proof. So in the beginning of our book, we, we go through some concrete examples showing hidden motives being perhaps a bit more common than you might have realized. Now, that's not going to prove that they're as common as we say in the book. The rest of the book is what we need to show that, but at least it makes it more plausible. All right. So years ago, um, doctors, for some reason, later deemed to be inappropriate, decided that they would try to fix some problems by splitting people's brains. So inside your head are two halves of your brain connected by a short, a small connection. So it really is like two halves of a brain and a small connection. So these surgeons went in and cut that connection. And that basically put two brains in their, in the heads of these patients who couldn't really talk to each other except via external cues by seeing what they were doing. So each half of your brain is connected to one eye and one ear and controls one arm and one leg. And then one of the half of your brain controls your mouth. So then they would put these patients in an environment where they could split what these brains could see and hear so that they could talk to one ear and the other ear wouldn't hear it. And they could show something to one eye and the other eye wouldn't see it. And now they could talk to one brain and then see what the other brain does. <laughs> and so in particular, they could tell one brain in their ear, stand up. <laughs> and then that brain was cooperative enough to use its one arm and one leg to start standing up. And then the other arm and leg would go along with it and help stand up because, you know, we're cooperative, these two parts of the brain. And then you could ask the other half of the brain, why did you stand up? And you have to see that this other half of the brain just doesn't know why they stood up because these brains are disconnected. They were just going along with the standing up and doing it. And the honest answer would, of course, be, I don't know why I stood up. You, you know, the other half of my brain seems to have been in charge of that. Why don't you ask them? And strikingly, that's not what we do. We, instead of saying that we don't know, we make something up. That is, we pretend like we do know why we do things, even when we don't. And so, for example, we might have said, I wanted to get a Coke. That's why I stood up. There's a vending machine over there, and I was going to head over to the vending machine. And the point is, this is very consistently what we do. When we don't know why we do something and somebody asks us, we make something up. That's just a very common human behavior. Now, it doesn't tell us how often we don't know why we do something. <laughs> It just shows us we're the sort of people who, if we didn't know why we did things, we would make up an answer instead of admitting it, which means we could have a high rate of not knowing why we do things, but it doesn't prove that. Let's connect that back to when we talked about earlier on about the press secretary. So we do it and then the press secretary comes out and explains it. And as you say in the show, The West Wing, the press secretary is like, oh, I'm actually at my best when I know least, when I'm the least informed person in the room. I can tell whatever story I want. I love that. When I actually know I'm not telling a lie, I'm better. But um, let, let's try and we've, we've 20 minutes left. Let's try and get some of the 10 aspects of life that you discuss because they're fascinating. They include body language, laughter, conversation, consumption, art, charity, education, medicine, religion, and politics. And I'll jump around a little bit. But I wanted to share one, the first one you start with, because I was I was telling this to my son, and he's he's only 11. And he loved this, because I told him about body language. And he said to me, Dad, this would make a great class in school. And I said, Well, that's the point. We teach kids language, but body language is such a huge element of communication. We don't teach them that. Apparently, they don't need to be taught. <laughs> and they don't want to admit to what they're doing with body language. So that's part of the key point. In all of these 10 chapters, we have a behavior and we have a standard explanation for that behavior. And then what we do is show you that that standard explanation doesn't work so well. We offer an alternative explanation that better explains the behavior, but then the meta question always has to be, well, why didn't we know? this better explanation for our behavior. And then our usual story about that is going to be that uh, admitting to this actual motive to our behavior would make us more vulnerable to accusations of norm violations. And so that's why we instead have this other explanation. So with body language, one of the things we do is what's called status moves. 
That is when you and somebody else are talking together, you negotiate a relative status relationship where you're not equal. One of you is higher status than the other in this relationship. And you negotiate this and show this through where your eyes look, the size of the, the space your body takes up, who looks directly, who looks away, who sets the pace of conversation or mo movement if you're talking. And there's a lot of these little details that, that you know, express this. And in fact, actors, you know, it helps them to pay attention to this explicitly in order to learn to be good actors. They want to show their body language on the stage or screen in order to show their relative status. Uh, but we aren't aware of this and in fact would deny it if we were just talking to a friend, we'd say neither of us is higher status, we're just friends and our body language would belie that. We, one of us is higher status. And this idea that one of us is higher status is violating one of our norms as friends. You know, the, one of the norms of friendship is we're just equal friends. <laughs> and since we're not actually equal friends, admitting to this would be a problem. And so that's why we are not wanting to talk about and be aware of our body language and let it be unconscious. Another example is, of course, flirting. We are often flirting with other people and context where we're not supposed to be flirting. We're not people we're not supposed to be flirting with, and we're not supposed to be flirting, and the context doesn't call for flirting, and yet we are flirting. <laughs> So we have to be unaware of our flirting so that if somebody says, stop flirting, we can say, I wasn't flirting. I was just being friendly. Don't, you know, don't accuse me of things I'm not doing. Well, let's cover consumption because we mentioned the idea of the arms race for light and the idea that we use purchases to flaunt our wealth is known as conspicuous consumption. I loved the thought experiment you introduced, the idea of an obliviated world where branding or any kind of ideas of flaunting your wealth are, are gone. Well, we ask you to imagine that when you bought products and services uh, and, you know, all the different color features and their expense and, you know, things like that, other people around you just couldn't notice uh, these features of the product. They would just see the functionality. They'd see that you had a shirt. They wouldn't see the color or texture. They'd see that you had a car, but they wouldn't know brand or speed. Just imagine that other people just couldn't see those things. Well, then your purchases and choices would just be less influenced by what other people would interpret from those choices because they couldn't see those things. And I think we all know that that would change your behavior because <laughs> we're all kind of aware that we often choose things with an eye to how other people will see them and how it will make us look through those uh, connections. And so... Uh, the idea of conspicuous consumption is this just idea that we make a lot of choices with an eye toward how people will see them and how they will see us as a result. And I think most people are aware that that happens to some degree, and they're just not willing to admit just how large a degree that is. And that's one of the interesting shows. So people might admit that you buy things, say, to show off your wealth. But our point is that you use your consumption to show off a lot more than your wealth. You show how independent you are, how ecological, how, what political association you have, what gender you are, you show your education, you show your tastes in music, etc. You, you just show a lot of things about yourself through consumption. And in fact, we say that advertising helps you expand the range of things you can say. So we show a picture of an advertisement about a beer, and the advertisement simply shows the beer on a bench at the beach. <laughs> And it doesn't really tell you anything else about the beer than it's on a bench at the beach. And you might think, well, they're not telling you all the other things you might want to say about the beer. They're not telling you price or saltiness or uh, expense or, um, you know, the kind of calories, <laughs> taste. They're not showing you any of those things about the beer. They're showing you that it's the beach. And you might think, well, what's the point of that? Well, the point is, if you're a person who's trying to show things about yourself, one of the things you might want to show is that I'm a beach person, but you might struggle to show that through the ordinary ways of your life. You could, you could wear sandals to the office, but that'd be pretty expensive the way you show your beach person. You could brush the sand off of your clothes, but that would also be expensive. How are you going to show you're a beach person? Well, uh, just holding this beer in your hand will show you're a beach person to someone else who's seen the ad and it expands your language. As long as you both see this as a beach symbol, then it is a beach symbol regardless of what's actually in the beer. 
And we can use advertising to expand the range of all the things we can say about ourselves. And we like that. We like to say many things about ourselves. And so advertising is something we enjoy by letting us express more details than we could otherwise express. We mentioned about wealth there and flaunting your wealth a little bit. Something closely related to that is art. So adorning my house with art. And again, you return to nature to show us that this is actually quite logical in nature and the brilliant example of the bower bird. There is a bird called the bower bird who the male spends a lot of time decorating a nest and they are very particular about the kinds of objects and colors and arrangement. And the females are very particular about which arrangements they will be impressed by. <laughs> and this is an example of animals using art to impress each other. And it's not the only example, of course, you might even think of bird songs as not just uh, communicating particular messages, but showing off an ability to construct bird songs. Uh, we humans do art. And uh, when you ask people, why do you do art? Uh, they want to focus on usually the experience that you get by consuming the art or being in the presence of the art. Uh, so a, a song makes you feel some way, a movie you know, tells you a story and, and gives you uh, some impressions. Looking at a painting, you get a sense of, of beauty or, or some sort of striking message of sort that you would get from the painting. When we talk about why we like art, we usually talk about the experience of the person consuming art. And then we might say, well, why does the art artist make it? And so then say, well, they want people to experience that and they experience it all the more themselves as they construct the art. And that art is about this constructed experience. Um, this story about why we consume art is somewhat difficult to understand in terms of why evolution would have created creatures which had such preferences, although people have spun many stories like this. But it's also some, well, in conflict with many details about how we appreciate art, which is that we are often sensitive to the cost and context of the creation of the art in ways that aren't reflected in the art itself. So, for example, very realistic paintings were highly valued until the introduction of the photograph, which made very realistic presentations uh, much cheaper. And then all of a sudden, people were not interested in very realistic paintings. They liked other kinds of paintings. We talk about how uh, in the United States, you know, a century and a half ago, uh, prisoners were served lobster regularly. And there were laws about how you couldn't serve them lobster more than so many days a week because that would be cruel punishment. Now, today, lobster is very expensive and rare, and so it's a luxury you get in restaurants, and nobody serves lobsters to prisoners. Uh, and we care about how many people made a piece of art. If it was made by a committee or a group of people, we are less impressed and less interested in the art. And if it was made by a single person, then that seems to be us more interesting. And so seeing the context of the creation of the art being important to us and whether we value the art suggests that it's more about being impressed by the artist and associating and affiliating with that artist. So as you talked about before, uh, even with coalitions, we want to impress other people with ourselves. We also wanna be able to discern other people and tell who's how impressive. And that's one of the abilities we are showing with art. That is some artists are better than others and they are more impressive. And the artists are trying to show that they are more impressive, but art lovers are trying to show that they are better able to tell who are the more impressive artists. That's a skill that's valued by others. You would like other people who you're allies with to be better at choosing who to have as your allies. And the better they are at discerning better people, the better your group will be at having better allies. On education, you had this experience. Like, so for example, Coursera, you can do all these online courses, you can get a degree from many of the excellent establishments all over the world but you won't get the slip of paper to say you got the degree the certification and you benefited from this massively where it didn't matter so much to you but so many people pay for that privilege because it's the privilege and it's the again the bower bird showing off the art that is so much more important than actually the art itself Stanford University is one of the most respected universities in the country, and I presume many students uh, would love to go there but can't get in, and they would be envious of Stanford students. But what exactly would they envy? So I was living near Stanford University, and I got in the habit of just going in and sitting in on Stanford classes without asking for permission. I didn't register or apply to the university. I just sat in on the classes and you know, participated in discussions, did some assignments and things like that. 
nobody cared. And in fact, professors would generally be flattered if somebody from outside the university wanted to sit in on their class without registering. Uh, that's a rare thing and would be some sort of endorsement of you as a teacher. So uh, I was able to do that. And, you know, nobody really tries to prevent that sort of thing. And in fact, one of my teachers wrote a letter of recommendation for me <laughs> on the basis of my participation in their class, which helped me get into graduate school. Uh, so the striking fact is that most students don't want to do this, even telling you now it's not going to cause a flood of students to go out and try to do this because you all know that what you really want is the degree and not the education. If you just wanted the education itself, you can go get that for free. Uh, and anyone can get the very best education uh, by doing that. But if what you want is the degree, well, then you're going to have to apply and get accepted and go through the usual paperwork. So it shows that we, in fact, want the degree more than we want the education itself. And again, it's an entanglement where actually what employers are looking for is the degree to show you can finish it. It's not actually the fact that you learned at all. It's relatively clear that people don't learn very much that's useful in school and what they do learn, they quickly forget. <laughs> Nevertheless, say bartenders who have a high school education make more than those who don't and bartenders who have the college degree make more than those with the high school education. We pay more for people with degrees, even when what they learned is not relevant to the job. Uh, and in fact, most of what people learn isn't relevant and they hardly remember much of what they supposedly learned. <laughs> Nevertheless, we still give students with degrees better jobs. And that's because probably on average, they are better at those jobs which means that the school is showing at least that they are better employees, even if it's not created through the process of these material they're learning in classes. My press secretary is telling me time's up. <laughs> so we've one last uh, piece of work, which is the, the medicine part I mentioned, and you introduced this brilliant hypothesis. And if there's one thing we learn throughout the book is that our motives are rarely the full st story here. And I'm going to read out this little passage that's just fantastic. It's the lo logic of conspicuous caring is especially clear in what happened to e England's King Charles II, who fell inexplicably ill on February 2nd, 8, 1685. The records of the king's treatment were released by his physicians who wanted to convince the public that they had done everything in their power to save the king. And what exactly did that entail? This is what happened. After a pint of blood had been drawn from his royal majesty, he was forced to swallow antimony, a toxic metal. He vomited and was given a series of enemas. His hair was shaved off and he had blistering agents applied to the scalp to drive bad humours downward. Plasters of chemical irritants, including pigeon droppings, were applied to the soles of the, his royal feet to attract the falling humours. Another ten ounces of blood was drawn. The king was given white sugar candy to cheer him up, then prodded with a red-hot poker. He then <laughs> he was then given 40 drops of ooze from the skull of a man that was never buried, who it was promised had died a most violent death. Finally, crushed stones from the intestines of a goat from East India were forced down the royal throat. Not surprising you tell us, King... Charles died on February 6th, four days later. <laughs> but you say, notice all the conspicuous effort made in the story. And this is the key to one of the themes you talk about in the chapter on medicine. Modern medicine has many valuable treatments and processes that can help people get well and prevent them from getting sick. But the overall style of medicine is pretty similar today to distant past periods when medicine was far less useful or effective. <laughs> and this story of this king is an example. Uh, so most of these things that they did were hurtful, actually, and not helpful. Uh, and we actually have medical textbooks from ancient Egypt from <laughs> over 4,000 years ago, uh, describing how they treated people then. And those ancient Egyptian textbooks have a pretty similar description. That is, well, there's experts and they go to school to learn how to be experts. And they look at a lot of complicated things to figure out what category to put you in, in terms of your problem. And then they have a lot of expensive, obscure, complicated treatments to give you that, uh, that nobody else could think of giving you because uh, they are so random and, and specific. Uh, and most of them hurt you. <laughs> Uh, but that's been the nature of medicine for a very long time. 
And even if today we're better at it, we seem to be doing way too much medicine today. And so the marginal medicine is in fact not helpful, even if it's finally good enough to not be hurtful either. <laughs> that is, I, I mentioned before, randomized experiments where you give people more medicine or less, and the people who get more are no less, are, are just as healthy and, and not more healthy than the people who, who get less. So why do we do all these things? Well, the idea is that we are trying to show we care about each other. So think about the analog of a Valentine's chocolate. <laughs> On Valentine's Day, a uh, tradition is you give your loved one some chocolates. Now, when you do that, you don't ask yourself how hungry they are uh, to decide how many chocolates you give them, because that's not the point. You need to give enough chocolates to show that you care, which is going to be more than they're really hungry for. So you're going to have extra unneeded chocolate you give them, just like we give people extra unneeded medicine. When you think about the quality of the chocolate you give them, you really don't care about what your private opinion about quality is or their private opinion about quality. What you care about is what are the shared perceptions of quality? If the, uh, if the enema is what everybody says is good to give the king, then you want to give that to the king and the king wants to take it regardless of what they privately think about the effectiveness of that particular treatment. Uh, and similarly for Valentine's Day, uh, you want to give the kind of chocolate everybody would give and give credit for, even if you think otherwise. And you're not actually very interested in private signals about the quality of medicine or chocolate. Robin, I love the book. And um, I know you're, you're, one of the things you mentioned is that, you know, it, it can be a difficult reading for some people, like some people don't want to take the, the pill to unveil the elephant. <laughs> I, I absolutely loved it. And it does help us unveil the elephant. But I wanted to just ask you before we finish, I have a final quote that I absolutely love. And I'm going to share that and then I'm going to hand over the mic to you to close today's show. But before I do, where can people find you and more about the book and your work? I have a website, hansen.gmu.edu. I'm on Twitter at Robin Hansen. I uh, just type in the word Robin, Robin Hansen into Google uh, or another search engine and easy to find things about me. Brilliant, Robin. Okay, I'm going to finish on this quote that, that I loved um, because it, it speaks a little bit to the spirit of this show as well. And it says, to the little guys, often grumbling in the corner, who've said this sort of thing for ages, you are right more than you knew it. I love that little line. It just spoke to me. And I just wanted to share that. Robin, I'm going to hand over to you. What's your final message for our audience? What's your final message for their press secretaries or their elephants in their brains? Evolution decided that you shouldn't know this stuff. <laughs> That, and in the ancient environments, that was quite plausibly true. That is, you know, what you, your world hardly changed. People have been doing the same thing for many thousands of years. And you weren't in charge of trying to decide how to organize your world or what, how to do things. You just did what everybody had always done. And you, the things you did made sense. And you didn't really need to know exactly why you were doing what you were doing. <laughs> you needed to protect yourself from accusations. Now, today, uh, we live in a different world, but still a lot of factors are similar in the sense that we still need to protect yourself from accusations and having false beliefs about your motives actually helps you do that and helps you in the modern world. So if your main priority is just to go about your life and have a smooth interaction with the people and have people like you and respect you, then you probably don't want to know this stuff. And you are really quite capable of forgetting everything you've just heard. That's a thing people can do. And, you know, as a teacher, I can tell you students are, have shown that capability over and over again for millennia. So that's not a problem. Now, why might you want to remember this stuff? Well, perhaps you're in a role in society where you especially need to understand other people and you can't quite rely so much on just copying what everybody else has done. You might be a manager or a salesperson or you really need to see people's motives and that would help you sort of invent a new sales technique or a new way to pitch things. And then you need to understand things there. You might be someone like me who's relatively nerdy, wherein the usual intuitions about just how to do things don't quite so easily come to your mind. So for someone like me, you'll need to think through things a little more consciously in order to figure out what the better things to do are. I mean, that will come at the expense of your sincerity, but honestly, you're if you're like me, you're, you're stump clumsy enough, you're better off consciously doing the right thing, uh, you know, for less sincere reasons than doing what you would usually do. But the main target of our book are people who 
want to understand the social world around them in order to recommend larger social changes. People who want to think about politics or policy and social science. If your job in the world is to describe and understand the social world enough to, you know, make claims about it or recommend changes to it, then it's your responsibility to know what's actually going on. And you should read a book like this or get the same information from some other source. You should know what we're actually doing. And yes, that will make it a bit harder for you to sell your ideas to the usual customers in the sense that you will perhaps have to tell them things they don't want to hear about what things are for and what changes will have what effects. But hey, if that's your job, that's what you got to do. Author of The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life, Robin Hansen. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.